So the aim of this talk is <coughs> to first just make a kind of review of some aspects, some conceptual issues that might raise in, in, the, in, in quantum gravity, where we take the assumption that maybe, uh, as kind of working hypothesis, maybe space-time as we know it in GR might not be there in some sense. Uh, and, and so the kind of conceptual issues that might uh, arise in this context. And then I'd like to distinguish, because this, is, this has been discussed already in the, for, for some time now by people in this room among others, uh, I'd like to discuss, to, to distinguish more precisely uh, uh, two kinds of issues, the, the more uh, epistemic ones uh, and the more ontological ones. The, sometimes two, the, 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 the distinction between the two is, 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 is not entirely clear. Um, for instance, this um, comes under the name of uh, threat of empirical incoherence, this kind of thing. And this distinction has um, typically come up to my mind with discussion with uh, Nick uh, Huggett in Chicago. Uh, um, among other uh, people. And this work, part of this work, has, has been done in collaboration with uh, Chris Zutry. Uh, okay, and then <coughs> I'll, try to, I'll try to elaborate, discuss a little bit with you uh, what I understand with uh, functionalism in this, uh, in this story and how this kind of functionalist approach tools, conceptual tools, may alleviate help with these uh, issues. So the aim to identify the conceptual issues, uh, most of you know. Related to this notion of emergence of space time from a level where space time, the classical space time in some sense might not be fully there, um, make this distinction and then suggest a functionalist strategy. And I'll try to, to, to try to look what I mean by functionalist there, might be a little bit different from other understandings of more precise understanding of functionalism. And also make an analogy with all other analysis in, in philosophy of science where functionalist tools have, uh, have been used like the philosophy of mind or the debate in the ontology of quantum mechanics. So this is the, this is the thing, kind of working, working uh, um, hypothesis. That, that, that's the idea that it seems from several research programs from gravity that space and time, classical space time, in some sense, might not be part of the quantum ontology. Um, this is not necessarily so, but again, <coughs> it's, it's a possibility. And, and the idea of this talk is to explore a little bit the concept of issues that might arise from taking this hypothesis uh, is possibly seriously. And I'll <coughs> focus on two sets of conceptual issues, well-known one called empirical incoherence, brought from another context, I'll discuss this a little bit. And um, the more cons the ontological one about characterizing a physical ontology without space and time and related uh, issues. So I start with the first one. Uh, that's <coughs> very roughly a bit the structure of what I understand with this uh, issue of empirical incoherence. Uh, it starts with this assumption. It seems that empirical evidence for physical theory always involves somehow physical objects being located in space and time, a pointer pointing somewhere, something, uh, <laughs> and things like that. Uh, more specifically, it's, some people might argue that time have argued that time and change are required for a physical confirmation because it's, it's fundamentally a dynamic process. So we need time and change in some sense. It makes sense for empirical data that we see around us in laboratories and so on. And then the second step is to say that this first step involves that, uh, or implies that empirical evidence and empirical data involves the fundamental, maybe, or the existence of space time in some sense. Uh, so we need space time in order to make sense of empirical data. That's the idea. And therefore, the conclusion, um, any theory or framework, theoretical framework denying the fundamental existence, but again, that's, been, that's to be discussed, fundamental existence of space time, um, cannot account for what we see around us on empirical data. Uh, so it somehow undermines the possibility of, of being uh, empirically confirmed in the first place. That's a little bit the, the, the end here. Of course, from a physics point of view, this is just about the consistency constraints. Okay, any kind of uh, as people working in quantum gravity, that kind of, that's, that's, that's a constraint. Any, any quantum gravity theory somehow should recover uh, the space-time structure of GR in, 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 some, in the appropriate regime. That's just a kind of technical issue, issue can, can be, of course, non-trivial, but <coughs> involving approximation and meeting procedures, which, but it's a constraint <coughs> on, on, on theory building. Right? So we just have to recover uh, the GR. We all know this. But then the question here is that for more conceptual, of you, whether this is 
uh, sufficient, not necessary, but uh, whether it's sufficient for the, the challenge of incoherence to be, to be met. And <coughs> um, more precisely, whether we need a notion, a criterion of physical salience. So if we can derive, let's, let's assume that we have a quantum gravity framework, and we can derive mathematically consistently in some sense GR from it, then <coughs> is, it is it sufficient, okay? Or do we need something more like criterion of the condition, the criterion of physical salience for this mathematical derivation of GR from quantum gravity to make sense, to make physical sense? That's the idea here. Um, and another aspect of it is, is more conceptually somehow, more ontologically, how can we make sense of possibly non spatial temporal entities described by this uh, hypothetical quantum gravity framework? non spatial temporal entities possibly? Uh, how can we make sense of these entities constituting somehow constituting somehow things being located in space and space and features? Seems okay. um, non-trivial. Seems <coughs> to be a conceptual issue here on top of it, just uh, physical uh, consistency. Okay, here's an analogy. Uh, it's a debate in the, the, the ontology of quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, it's the conception in the ontology, in the debate over the ontology of quantum mechanics, according to which we take the, the, the quantum wave function is, is, is taken as a, as a real physical entity living on this uh, high dimensional configuration space and evolving in time. So, in this picture, if we take this conception seriously, we don't have to speak in front of three space. Um, and the challenge here is somehow similar in some sense to account for empirical data. Uh, in three space, pointer pointing and so on, this is uh, John Bell's uh, reflection, for instance. Um, out of this picture uh, centered on the, the way the quantum wave function. And people like David Albert and so on have uh, suggested that we can give it such an account. Uh, typically, he has suggested that, that the, the, the three situations, the ordinary three objects in three space, are just encoded in the form of the Hamiltonian, uh, if, we, if we have. A uh, if you choose correctly the coordination, coordination of the configuration space. Okay, and the, the idea here, the details are not important, the underlying idea is that the, the quantum wave function on configuration space, this physical field that we take seriously. <laughs> Welcome to Nino. Welcome. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So it's beautiful, no? It's beautiful out there, yes. <laughs> That's very practical, I guess. <laughs> um, so the, the idea is pretty clear. It's just to say that somehow this weird object, this, this, uh, this weird field living on this high dimensional space, can somehow play the, the causal role of what we see around us, of pointers in, in you know, three uh, objects, like pointers pointing, and, 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 and so the integral data in, in ordinary three objects. That's the idea. Here. And then <coughs> people have raised this worry that, OK, possibly you can give me a story, mathematically coherent, how to recover things in three space out of this weird picture. But <coughs> the question is, how can we know that such mathematical derivation of data in three space in this picture is physically salient? Because we can choose another coordination of configuration space where three space is not, of, of uh, configuration space where three space is not privileged. So it seems that you know you have to know beforehand that three spaces or object in three space or, or four dimensional space time um, is, is somehow physically salient. Again, how do we know that? That's typically Tim Morgan's challenge here. Another challenge <coughs> is okay, even if all this uh, work, it seems that um, the quantum wave function is just the wrong entity there. It cannot constitute somehow. Empirical data. And Alison May, for instance, has written about this and she gives the argument about the hologram. So the hologram can play the role in some sense, some role of an object is uh, hologram of, but of course it does not constitute uh, the, the, the object. So you, you cannot capture the nature somehow of the empirical data uh, we need to, to recover. That's the, idea. That's the analogy with this debate here. Um, yeah. Now, um, now, the, the, the question about the, the, the issue about the, the physical ontology without the characterization uh, of the physical ontology without space-time, there are two aspects of this ontological question. First, the first aspect 
is how to characterize the fact that you have many objects, a plurality of homophobic objects, possibly at the homophobic level uh, in this non spatial temporal context. That's a possible question we could ask. Another one, I'll, I'll, I'll rather focus on this one, is <coughs> um, what makes such an ontology, possible ontology, described by quantum gravity without space time uh, physical in contrast to an ontology of, I don't know, mathematical objects, for instance. Okay. What extent are these objects described by quantum gravity uh, physical and not merely mathematical, like numbers and so on? Typically, <coughs> typically um, the criterion for such a distinction between physical and mathematical uh, have been space time and causation of okay? Concrete physical entities are in space time or some of them have space time features, whereas abstract mathematical uh, ones uh, are not in space time. Clearly, in this controversy context, it's not appropriate as a, as a criterion for, our, for, um, for concreteness. Uh, the other, the other stand-up one is causation. Concrete physical entities, as opposed to abstract mathematical ones, are uh, considered to be causally efficacious in some sense. Um, but of course, in this context, in this contemporary context, it requires a notion of um, non-spatial temporal causation. Again, assuming that the fundamental level described by quantum gravity is non-spatial temporal in some sense. And the idea here, <coughs> the strategy is to combine these two, uh, in, in some sense, these two standard criteria. Okay? The, the strategy here, uh, I call uh, we call um, functionalists, is to focus on the space-time functions, the functions played by space-time, the, the, the spatio-temporal space-time-like roles in some role sense, not necessarily causal, that the fundamental quantum gravity entities or the entities described by quantum gravity may instantiate. Okay? The roles played by these uh, entities described by the, the quantum gravity theory of frameworks. Um, and <coughs> here, the idea is to focus on the roles played by space-time uh, in accounting for empirical evidence in various theoretical contexts, with UGR and so on, rather than on these notions of constitution or composition, or the nature of space-time and so on. And this shift in focus on the roles, played, the relevant roles played by space-time, um, this may um, allocate some of the conceptual worries I've just uh, mentioned. I'll try to just sketch a little bit how uh, this might be so. Just before that analogy with, <coughs> if you talk about functionalism to philosopher of science, directly ring a bell about uh, the debating philosopher of mind, where uh, mental states, because this is a very old question, the, the relationship between uh, the mind and body, okay, mental states and brain states, and one strategy here, one functional strategy which has been developed is just to understand mental states in terms of their functional roles, okay, the mental states like being in pain, and understood in terms of their relations to sensory inputs, other mental states, and, and behavioral outputs. Um, and this, uh, these roles, this role can be represented by an ontology of by, by, by brain states. Okay? This, is, this is one way to understand the relationship between mental states and um, brain states. Typically, being in, space, in, in pain very roughly can be understood as the property of an animal that is uh, caused by damage to its tissues and, and, and cause uh, different uh, behavior and so on. Okay, but the idea here, of, of course, then there are a huge amount of literature of how exactly to understand this and, and what, what's the implication, what's the metaphysics behind it and so on. I'm not interested in this. Um, the idea here really is the, the, the focus on the function, is on the function realized by possibly by the brain states, uh, rather than on the constitution of the mental states. What's the constitution? How? What's the constitution of, of, of mental states? That's the idea. And here, I think there is a similarity with the case of uh, space-time. So, functionalism of space-time in this understanding is <coughs> uh, the idea that space-time can be functionally characterized in terms of its roles in physical theories. It's well described by physical theories, uh, like GR, for instance, and these functions may be executed, realized not by uh, relative space time, but rather by an underlying ontology described by quantum gravity, by this small quantum ontology described by uh, the quantum gravity framework. And the idea here is that space time, relativistic space time, may not be fully recovered. Uh, emerge in some strong ontological sense because there is all this debate about ontological emergence and so on uh, to provide a ground for empirical evidence, evidence because this is the aim, remember, okay, to give an account of how it makes sense of empirical data in three space in this context. Um, what we need 
from this point of view, it's only the relevant space and features relevant for empirical confirmation, for empirical data. Um, and this, of course, allows for deviations, like the notion of this own locality in, in certain uh, context, uh, and of course, for new predictions, therefore. Okay, that's that's the, 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 the strategy here. In the slogan form, this is Chris uh, putting a uh, uh, slogan, it's, it's space time is as space time does. There's not, nothing, uh, nothing beyond that. No question about its nature and so on. From this point of view. Uh, and it's enough for um, uh, resolving, addressing some of the, the conceptual issues I've mentioned. Um, here, there are several ways to understand then the details of this uh, of this strategy. Here's one one typical standard way in, in the field of mind literature to understand um, the relationship between a higher level and a lower level. Um, call it reduction or emergence. And, and whether it's reduction or emergence, I think Michael Stahl will talk about this tomorrow. I'm not. Uh, it's not very interesting to me because the, I don't see necessarily a, a tension between the, the two notions here. Whether we call it functional reduction of space time to the current level or, or emergence, uh, this is uh, not necessarily relevant here. Here is an example. So you consider the first time you consider high level properties, public space time properties, <coughs> to be functionalized. That is, they are given a functional definition in terms of their role. You describe by the roles of your theory and so on. And then you give an explanation to how, to how the lower level properties can, can, can just realize these functional roles. Okay? So this is typically Kim, typically Kim in the of mind or philosophy of special sciences, uh, has um, elaborated this kind of strategy for understanding the relationship between these levels. Um, and a nice feature, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, is that different lower level properties, for instance, at the quantum gravity level, can play the same uh, functional space time roles. Okay? It's called in, in the field of literature, it's called multiple relativity. Typically, which, um, there is an analogy in the physics um, literature with the notion of universality. Uh, and this is, I think, a nice feature of this, of this um, understanding. Uh, in the space-time case, we look something like that. The run space-time properties, uh, in particular, the, the, the properties, space-time properties relevant for empirical confirmation, like localization again, maybe, need to be understood in terms of a functional role. Okay? Of course, that's the first step. Of course, then, uh, we can have an interesting debate about what exactly the functional role of, of, of space-time, what are the relevant uh, feature uh, of space time which need to be functionalized. There is work to be done here. For instance, Bouchard, <laughs> I think, yeah, might talk a little bit about this. And, and then in the second step, of course, <coughs> and we need to, to provide an explanation of how the entity described by the quantum gravity can, 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 can fill this functional world. And typically, here, the philosopher will rely on, on, on the work of, of physicists uh, uh, giving us a story about uh, how this uh, relationship, how this uh, Filling the walls that might, uh, might be in the different cryptographic frameworks. I've just given a <coughs> very rough, brief example of how this might work about <coughs> localization, typically. Remember that this very common view about the spread of empirical incoherence crucially relies on the fact that empirical evidence involves some of special type of localization. The pointer has to, to be somewhere in order to, to, for us to have empirical data. Um, uh, but here, <coughs> if we take uh, the view that it's a, it's a phenomenal consequence, as uh, uh, several quantum gravity programs state, that there is no external fixed physical background with respect to which uh, physical systems are, are, are localized, then it seems, in this functionalist perspective, that local localization is not inherently spatial temporal in the sense that not only with respect to a space time background, but rather, again, from this functional perspective, from the dynamical, in the sense of uh, respect to other dynamical systems. Okay. If you take this perspective, it seems that then here localization already at the GR classical level can be somehow functionally understood in, in terms of the right uh, functional relationships between uh, uh, physical and uh, fields. Here is an example <coughs> of the this construction of a like, gauging by localization in, in, in GR as, as again, as, as functional relations between among dynamical entities. This was 
this would announce somehow the, this first step, okay, the functional reduction and emergence, the, the first step of the functional definition. Here I give an example where <coughs> you can localize uh, a, a, a physical tensor field with respect to um, a Maxwell field and some respects to, to four independent scalar fields. For instance, here I give the example of the, the, the Bergman functionals of the of the, of the metric field, the, the, the latest scalars, for instance. And here, these fields okay, play uh, the, the kind of right sort of localization function for, for space time points. Okay? You don't need to talk about space time points there. They give you physical coordinates in a chart independent way you know, for your own space time, provided that you don't have too many symmetries and so on, of course. But this is <coughs> just an example, okay? It might be very contrived, very complicated to construct this to, to, to build these these five scales and so on, but it just gives you a flavor of how this functional uh, perspective on localization might work. Here we can, again, we can reconceive this, not that be as being about things being located in space time, but as, as for our naive understanding of when people data and when people have information, but rather as <coughs> the right sort of functional relations among dynamic entities being fulfilled, realized. Just the idea. So here, the, the, the localization function can be realized in, in different ways within GR, in the sense of with respect to different dynamic entities. We can choose different scalar fields, for instance, or other good things. Um, just an, uh, an, uh, a side note here. There is a potentially interesting link between uh, three notions here. You know, an understanding of relationalism, <coughs> understood as, um, in the sense of the position of about the nature of space-time being about relations among uh, time, ab about material entities rather than a substantial thing uh, distinct, ontologically distinct of, of matter and s structural realism, so structuralism in the sense that physical entities are best characterized in relational terms rather than in terms of intrinsic properties there is no dismiss there and the kind of functionalist story of, I've tried to sketch here kind of convergence of different uh, views in philosophy or metaphysics um, about space-time, about the nature of objects, and about understanding the relationships between different levels. Might be interesting to me. Okay, of course, <coughs> hard work now to show in concrete cases how quantum gravity entities can play the right sort of functional roles. And again here, the job of the philosopher, I think, is just to look at concrete quantum gravity programs and to see what's the story. Um, they can give us in order for this second step to be to be satisfied. And remember that's about how the quantum gravity entities can uh, fill the right sort of functional walls uh, for uh, us to make sense of empirical data. Um, we have a paper on this with Chris, and in, in, I'm not going to talk, uh, go into details about this, but we discuss uh, the story given by causal set theory and a little bit the also, the story in the, in the, in the mechanical gravity, new no quantum gravity, uh, for instance. Um, uh, um, a nice feature, as I mentioned before, is that um, we can have, it seems, different uh, uh, quantum gravity entities playing the same uh, uh, functional, uh, higher level uh, space time role. Um, and this is, this is typically, this is entirely natural from Funkler's point of view. Okay? Remember why? Because at the higher level, at the space time level, for instance, or at the, 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 in the analogy of the philosophy of mind at the mental state level, uh, we, we can give, we can define the, 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 the functional role, and then at the lower level, if there might be several different entities playing the same high level functional role here at the same space time level. I think is going to talk a little bit about this. And this might be a nice feature here, this kind of polypoint versatility, versatility or yeah, this flexibility, let's say, of this kind of framework. Because again, why? Because we, we might have a different quantum gravity entity described by quantum gravity playing the same uh, functional uh, space and more at a higher level, at the level of GR, for instance. This is a nice feature of this kind of perspective. You just give a very uh, naive example of the semi classical spinet with the so called wave states. You can have a similar story with coherent states. Uh, playing the kind of average metrical role, you have the area and volume operator 
uh, applied to this, the device of network states, having almost <coughs> uh, classical eigenvalues. That's a little bit the, the idea. And of course, <coughs> we can have uh, different uh, network states for this form. Okay. Um, and of course, this is to be expected, okay? where space-time features are functionally realized through the collective dynamics of quantum gravity degrees of freedom. Uh, this is something that you can find uh, in a group field theory of these kind of approaches as well, where <coughs> there is a strong analogy with thermodynamical features, okay? Uh, that, that a given thermodynamical feature can be realized by a first different configuration. Um, but then, and this is, I think, Nick, I guess, raised this point to me and to us, uh, that we, uh, it's, we might question to what extent this is a general case of multiple relativity, because remember, in the case of philosophy of mind, the, the story was about the uh, same brain state, like Zeno and Kelly, being a uh, base state type, so being realized by different, in different ways, in radically different ways, by different organisms, for instance. Um, uh, and here it's not clear that uh, we have such a genuine case of multiple relativity. In thermodynamics, for instance, few people maybe would say that you have a case of multiple relativity, and here, to some extent, it's, it's modest. But still, uh, this is about the field of the Still, I think this, this flexibility of this kind of framework is, is interesting. OK. Uh, and then, <coughs> question of analogies uh, of empirical data. Recall uh, the threat of empirical coherence, no space time, no empirical evidence. Uh, uh, it seems that any uh, way of empirical justifying one theory is undermined. From the function of control's perspective, no worry. Why? Because all that is required for people justification is that the quantum gravity entities play the right sort of uh, functional role. Okay? Typically, the right sort in the sense of the, the role of empirical data located in space time. What looks like uh, empirical data located in, in, in relatively space time in the appropriate limit. And from this point of view, and this is for Baptiste, there is no space time uh, qualia. Okay? Qualia is a technical term that was applied for this kind of phenomenological. Um, a feature that is not captured by this uh, functional story of the relationship between uh, mental states and brain states. Okay? So no hard problem here. But Baptiste will uh, be open by this in his talk. Okay, remember uh, the challenge of uh, physical salience. Here, <coughs> this is also something Nick Huggett uh, raised uh, in his uh, comments. Um, kind of epistemic skepticism that we can have. To what extent are we justified in believing that in, in, in believing in norms such general quantum gravity is beyond or independently of the space and world? It seems that the only way to know about these quantum gravity entities uh, is in terms of the space and walls. So, um, how can we be justified in, 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 in going beyond their, their, their space and walls since that's all we can have access to? Or in, in, in other terms, another way to put it is to that the just justification ultimately seems less temporal. The justification for uh, physical salience okay, of the mathematical derivation in, uh, in quantum gravity. Um, so in other terms, again, the conditions for physical salience seem ultimately less temporal, uh, irreducibly less temporal. And um, an obvious reply is just to say. A new theoretical framework like quantum gravity can provide its own conditions for physical statements. Okay? It's not like physical. Uh, it's not like uh, we have predefined conditions of physical statements given once and for all, and then we just have to we just have to, uh, to live with this. No, uh, a new theoretical framework can provide new conditions. And I think typically the work of this has been also. Um, or will be, or has been elaborated by Nick and Chris in their work. Um, and <coughs> the good thing here, and this is something I want to emphasize in this talk, is that <coughs> the, the, fun the, the functions perspective advocated here also has a kind of epistemic uh, uh, interesting feature in the sense that it, en in it ensures that the standard epistemological discussion can just proceed. Then can be you can advocate a standard uh, scientific realist with respect to quantum gravity, or you can be instrumentalist in the theory. This is the standard debate. But the, the functionalist perspective just ensures that there is nothing specific about uh, uh, classical space time not being there for these epistemic debates. 
And typically, the scientific uh, realist can just have the normal stance of connecting herself to the central quantum gravity entities. And this is important, uh, crucial for novel empirically successful predictions. To the extent that we have empirically successful predictions in quantum gravity, then the, the standard uh, scientific strategy, uh, scientific realist strategy, just applies, I think, in this function is respected, nothing special. Really. The challenge of constitution, remember <coughs> the idea was, um, uh, was the challenge was that it seems that functionalism somehow cannot account for how something spatial temporal can non spatial temporal can constitute things with space and features. In a similar way, it's not clear how um, a hologram can constitute an object with this hologram. It's not clear how um, how brain states can constitute mental states, different nature. Something is not captured by the functional role. The functional roles do not exhaust the nature of this, this opposition. But of course here, <coughs> the stance is just to say that, first of all, the notion of spatial temporal constitution involved sometimes in these debates is not adequate in this context. Okay. Kind of golden box politics sometimes in the quantum gravity literature. Um, and it's maybe not, not intuitive, but perfectly coherent here to, to, to have the position that nothing about relevant smooth space-time features beyond their functional role uh, uh, out there. There's nothing else again. It's just the space-time is as space-time does. There is not, no, nothing in coherence uh, to saying that there is nothing beyond these, uh, these functional roles. That's, that's the, the, the obvious reply. So no constitution problem. It's just because you have a wrong attitude with uh, the theory. Um, and finally, the more ontological question about um, what makes such an ontology without space-time as described by quantum gravity physical, okay, outside space-time or without space-time, in contrast to an ontology of abstract, fully abstract mathematical entities. And here, <coughs> I think uh, an, an interesting move, possible move for the functionalist in this sense is to say that the, 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 the structures, the entities described by, by quantum gravity are, are concrete, physical, as opposed to abstract mathematical entities. In virtue of the, the, the space and walls, precisely, that you can play in certain circumstances. This is, this is crucial here. So in this sense, it's a combination of the standard strategies, of the standard criteria that we, that we have seen for concreteness versus abstract things. Um, there might be a worry in certain quantum gravity programs where um, we might have phase, non geometrical phases, for instance, where entities are not directly linked to space time functions. Um, but again, it seems that in order to be considered as concrete, again, as opposed to pi or purely uh, mathematical entity, it seems that somehow the quantum, the entity is described by, by, by this quantum, quantum gravity level. Um, let's somehow relate to some extent to, to, to the ones playing the right sort of space and walls for accounting for people there. Okay? Typically through some kind of phase transition or something, but there must be a relation. Otherwise, the, the very distinction between, um, abstract, uh, between concrete and abstract there is um, out here in mind. Okay, uh, close with this. Just summary. Uh, just wanted to uh, show you a different kind of conceptual issues in quantum gravity, the more ontological issues about characterizing the quantum level without space and time, the constitution question, um, and there are more epistemic aspects to the issues, like it's kind of epistemic skepticism that one might have. And then I've tried to argue that uh, a, a broad functionalist perspective in the sense of, I've mentioned that defined might help to, to address these issues. For instance, the question about the emergence in, in functionalist uh, terms and the, the epistemic relevance of the kind of, uh, functionalist strategy advocated here. Um, that's all. Thank you.
can you maybe sort of briefly summarize what is your response to the space-time identity theorist? So, so we, maybe the identity theorist could say that the functions you identified are just properties of the special kind that space-time is. So what is it? What is it that suggests to you that we should be functionalists and not space-time identity theorists? I think it's more flexible as a framework. I think you can you can massage some more kind of identity theory. This is this is for the people uh, doing the, the, the framework, but uh, you don't need to. And here, at least, it, it allows you to have more um, freedom for um, yeah, more flexibility again. So, to ask, so the, the suggestion would be to say functionalism is not incoherent and it's more flexible. So yes. it's sort of just offering the position yeah, to that yeah, It offers theory. all you need. Yeah. Without too heavy uh, metaphysical costs. So it's, there's some an, an aspect of metaphysical passing Yes, true. Yeah. And, 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 and by the way, this is the debate we have with Christopher. Yeah. We think uh, that there are many issues or questions just dissolve if you take this kind of perspective. I think mean, maybe that's the take-home message. Yeah. And that makes it desirable somehow. Yes. I mean, I'll say a tiny bit about this in my talk, but I think there's another response to that, which is I think that, that not all of the analogies between the debate and mind mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, go through here, yeah. because I think space time is a theoretical term, and in, and in the debate and philosophy of mind, you rely on the fact that you have kind of ways to establish reference to different kinds of states to establish the identity, and it's just not clear that that's the way the debate proceeds when you're talking about something that's as robustly a theoretical term, if you think that's like, I don't think you can make sort of extensive reference to space time for that. Right? So, so some of the positions like identity theory, I think, are easy to cash out in the same way that they do in the philosophy of mind. I think, you can, mm -hmm. I think there's, a, there's a real sense in which you can think of functionalism as the only game in town because of the nature of the theoretical term in a way that's different from the, the philosophy of mind. That's, yeah. if, if that's yeah. something yeah. Yeah. Again, I think our framework is not committed to taking space time only as a theoretical term. You have more robust to do it space time and still holding this kind of view. <laughs> yeah, uh, to, to follow up on that, uh, I agree with you that I think the framework that we're proposing um, for quantum gravity is certainly also consistent with the assumption that space-time is not uh, a theoretical term, but space-time is a concrete physical thing like, uh, or, or a concrete thing, I should say, maybe without committing to physical like pain or, 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 or anything like that. It's at least possible. Maybe that's the wrong thing to... Connection is a theoretical term, but it's a physical thing. But so that, that's not a, that, there's not a contrast. But I mean, but anyway, I think we may be using different phrases mm -hmm. of theoretical term here. I don't mean that it can't be a thing. Okay. It's about, it's about how we establish so, reference to yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Okay, mm -hmm. I see. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it may be a theoretical term. It may be uh, a common a, a term in, in common language that we refer to as we do to other everyday objects. I, I don't think that anything necessarily, uh, uh, or, or both possibilities should be able to be accommodated in that picture. Having said that, of course, it may be a, a mistake to think of space-time as uh, 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 along the same line as, as pain, or how, you know, the, as referring in the same way as pain does. Um, so that's just to, 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 to support what you said, I guess. Yeah, I'd also like to talk about what you said. I think really the difference boils down to what you think of functions, but you use it in order to pick out entities in the world, so as a, in, in the philosophy of mind, this is the reference fixing type mm -hmm. of functionalism, as opposed to mm -hmm. essence or analytic mm -hmm. functionalism, which mm -hmm. characterizes the entity in question by its functional role as its nominal essence. And that's what it boils down to. So if you use yes. functionalism right. as a reference fi fixing device, then it's a semantic tool to pick out reference. Mm -hmm. and you are neutral or silent, depending on mm -hmm. where, you, where you're standing on the metaphysically more juicy questions, like what's the right what's the category, what's the nature of this, yes. the green other state. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a little bit our attitude there. The world's feast we like the mortality. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I also have a um, kind of party pooper um, question, 
what's here in this quantum gravity um, community? What's so special about quantum gravity in, in this particular context? What I have in mind is, um, is there anything you couldn't say um, if you look at more the non-quantum projects of, let's say, reducing GR or special relativity? Um, if you think of special relativity, what about Rob's eliminativist program to reduce special relativity space-time to a well, causal notion? It's not really causal. Con con I mean, these are irreducibly spatial temporal, but it's a re reductionist program, and I think you take a lot of things. A lot of things, things you said here for quantum you could just as well say about um, Rob's um, causal program. And so I'm, I'm interested. What's so special about quantum gravity in this context? Uh, I think I think you, you're right. And, <coughs> and, uh, no, um, I think the again the the, the country strategy I think is very uh, versatile or flexible. Yes. So it can be accommodated in different frameworks. Really. And as the example that came, the of mine in the debate of the of quantum mechanics, and we got the framework as well. Um, but the thing here is, <coughs> I think there are specificities to the quantum gravity uh, case uh, which are best dealt with taking a, a structuralist uh, perspective. In, in other contexts, maybe I'm, here I'm thinking about the, the, the debate in the quantum mechanics. Uh, it's it's one possible option, interesting option, like taking the wave function as, as a physical entity and then having this kind of functional story. But it's not the only one, and, and the arguments in favor of other ones, like intuitiveness and so on. But here, I think that the, 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 the possibilities are, are much more restricted somehow, and, 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 and functionalism comes out as a kind of natural perspective or strategy in this specific quantum gravity context. That I mean, that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm involved with Quantum gravity. I'm just interested in what makes quantum work such a particularly interesting case, and is it just because quantum work is so kind of complicated and yes. complex so that we have no other answers to yeah, it? Thanks for um, uh, uh, yeah. To, to answer, trying to answer a point precisely your question. So I think what is specific about quantum gravity is, is the lack of genuine alternatives. Mm -hmm. That that would be the easy uh, the, 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 the most direct answer. That's, that's the most natural way of understanding the relationship between classical, smooth space time, mm. as described by GR, and possibly uh, different non spatial temporal ontology described by quantum gravity frameworks. The lack of alternatives, to, why should this not apply to, let's say, Rob's program? Because, it, in a sense, Rob's program is possibly the only fully worked out fundamental. Alternative to, to special relativity. Uh, again, a lack of alternative as, as a conceptual perspective. I take uh, the functions perspective mm -hmm. as being the most natural one to take in the quantum gravity context. That's the. That's the <laughs> yeah, isn't it possible? Because me, I mean, I would think the functions program is usually strengthened by the fact that it's actually really good working about classical theories as well. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that it can also accommodate quantum gravity mm -hmm. as a massive strength. It's not that it has to have something, it's not that it has to be better in the case of quantum, I mean, in the case of quantum gravity than classical yeah. theory. So if you're better off if it's a great way of thinking about classical theories too. And then it so happens that actually you can have <coughs> quantum gravity in the same framework that you might have wanted to think about classical yeah, yeah, see, see theory. You theory yeah, if, your, if your arguments go through, right? I mean, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, no, I see. It doesn't seem like it's an argument against space time functionalism that's going to be a non quantum gravity context. But I would say, I, I, I have mean, the opposite attitude in some sense, saying yeah. that I'm interested in the, in the problem in quantum gravity, and I take uh, the kind of function strategy to be in that the very the okay. most obvious one. Just and then I see yeah. that there are other people in different in different areas advocating similar tools, and, and, and there maybe there are alternatives, but, but these tools also make sense there, and, and so it seems like the yeah, whole thing is, is, is building. That's not mm -hmm. the, the way I approach it. It's not like, um, I, I want to advocate a functionalism about everything, and then I look at the different uh, areas of physics and all that. It's not. Okay, then, then maybe the reason why I think it would be very interesting to have a look at this comparison between functionalism in quantum gravity as opposed to functionalism in, in Rock's program would be that in Rock's program we can pretty well identify the nature of the fundamental constituents mm -hmm. as genuinely, irreducibly, spatial temporal, whereas in quantum gravity we just 
don't have any clue whatsoever what these things are in any shape. So, so you took it as, as an excellent case study? Or yeah, to this comparison of functionalism yeah. in quantum yeah. gravity as opposed to yeah. functionalism in box pro. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Chris. Uh, so, I think this is this is a very this is precisely the question where I think the Oxford attitude and the Geneva attitude are, are sort of like complementary a little bit to one another. If you're coming more from the, the the Oxford side of things, then you ask precisely that question. You think like so so what's the big deal about space time? Function? We've been advocating something like that all along. That's of course that's naturally the right way to think about it, and it has been going back to Rob or you know etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if you look at it from Geneva, uh, you, it, 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 as you as you said, to, to, to drive that point home a little bit more strongly, even it's it's um, that you think okay, the dynamical approach, a functionalist approach to special relativity or general relativity may be an attractive interpretive option at that at that level, but it's not the only game in town. You have a geometric approach. You may have a, a other approaches which are more realist about space-time or, or somehow different. And there seems to be a genuine debate. Uh, in quantum gravity, and this, I think, is where we're coming from, is it seems like these things are not spatial-temporal. So in, the, in a sense, you, you don't have the alternative anymore. It's, it's, it's almost as if the, 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 the geometrical approach or Maybe that's not the right word, but an approach too closely tied to a sort of a, 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 a strong form of space and realism is not available there anymore. Whereas, uh, you know, as opposed to Rob, you could just say, well, what's the problem with you, Rob? I'm a, a, a realist about Minkowski space time, and that's that. Uh, that you can reconstruct that that's a nice mathematical game you're playing, but it really has no metaphysical significance. And I think in quantum gravity, this is where we're coming from. We feel like, well, you know, you have to do something. You don't have any any, any of these alternatives anymore. So it, I don't know what uh, that hopefully addresses it a little bit. So it's like, that's the sense in which there's no alternative. You said you're <coughs> leading the discussion, right? Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, obviously, I could just keep on talking, so shut me up. <laughs> but, um, but, I, mean, I, just, I, mean, I completely see that, and I think you're right that the quantum gravity case pushes the case really forcefully. I just think the strategies are genuinely complementary, and you're kind of denying yourself an advantage of your position, right? If you don't think the classical... Because I mean, one of the arguments in the classical case is, yeah, you could be a subject, you can have these debates, but to some extent, properly conceived, perhaps there are debates about functional role, what functional roles you think space-time plays and what instantiates functional roles in classical theories anyway. And so I think maybe well, there's yeah. a more powerful way of seeing this as, as quantum gravity is less discontinuous yeah, exactly. no, no. with the tradition, which I think is quite a powerful yeah. argument right. for sceptical philosophy. You know, it goes along in the same way that you're in Nick Huggett's work, helps one to see that this isn't, you know, that really the right way that we should think about empirical coherence has quantum gravity being continuous in certain senses and empirical coherence of previous theories. I think that the same kind of strategy involves here, so so you can get your kind of Tim Ward and sceptical philosophers slightly more on side by saying, look, this was the right way to think about theories anyway. This is actually the right way to theorise. So I think so I think overdoing the contrast between the two approaches, I think, might I didn't deny you a tool for arguing for your I, approach. I really meant to say complementary <laughs> yeah. in a way. Yeah. It's a, a different sort of perspective. But yeah. No, no, I think it's certainly coming from two angles. But yes. I think it's a technical angle. It's well before it's coming at the same thing. And if there is an argument for some kind of continuity between a uh, right sort of perspective with respect to the classical yeah. theory, and, and then the obvious perspective with respect to the function. And ultimately, if we're right, these classical theories are true by virtue of the, if one thinks of them as true, that's how you think of it, by, by virtue of instantiating some kind of quantum gravity anyway. So, yeah. okay, here. Yeah. That's a little bit what I've tried to hint at, also from a different perspective without mentioning the. Dynamical approach, uh, <laughs> uh, in the sense of this kind of relationship between, between uh, at the classical level, really between uh, this kind of functionalist perspective that we might have, the relationalist uh, point of view about space time, and possibly separate whatever that means. It was a uh, brief comment on that. So that's a little bit in this direction. There is a continuity there, yes. Uh, Baptiste, first of all. Uh, yes, uh, I want to go to the juicy part of my talk. Uh, I was just thinking about uh, what you call epistemic skepticism, and I think that here there is an um, interesting connection between the kind of, uh, of uh, functionalism you endorse and the nature of the skeptic, skeptic challenge that you get. 
And the reason is that if you have a form of uh, functionalism which is uh, role functionalism, uh, or more ontological functionalism, so non order property functionalism, with multi realizability, then since from the realized structure you, you, you cannot be sure that there is only one fundamental structure able to realize its, this structure. So you have a, a harder skeptic challenge. Is that exactly how you put it? Because you said that uh, to what extent are we justified believing in non spatial temporal future entities beyond the role? But hey, it's even how can we know about the nature, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that this form of ontological functionalism triggers a kind of uh, skeptic challenge. When if you have a more, um, if you have a weaker form of functionalism, uh, or analytic functionalism or linguistic functionalism, coupled, for instance, with uh, an identity theory of uh, the reference terms or eliminatism about space-time, you don't really have a skeptic challenge like this. So I just wanted to point out that depending on the functionalism yes. that you select, we have different uh, epistemological principles. I see that, but this is, I see, thank you. But I, I think you have the kind of metaphysical reading, you have the metaphysician reading of this kind of words. It was just more uh, uh, more obvious in some sense. Just uh, a stand up, I don't know, uh, physicist, I don't know, just looking at these things and saying, or, or uh, the, the quantum gravity team Morgan, for instance, just uh, looking at these things and saying, yeah, okay. Fair enough, but uh, if, you, if you, yeah, the, the only way to, to make sense of these uh, entities are, uh, is in terms of the functional law. So, um, uh, how can we, how can I be justified to believe in, 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 in things beyond the functional law? Because the, the only way to justify them is in terms of the functional law. Kind of uh, circle, the uh, epistemic circle. And, I, I agree. It's but then we can we can reread this from the kind of more metaphysical. Uh, point so by the way, from uh, of course it's a metaphysical point of view, but mainly to physical consequences because it could lead to a form of um, of um, to the idea that we may not reach, we may not formulate, uh, we may not access to the fundamental ontology. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 physicist point of view without knowing all these philosophical debate about functionalism just look at this and, 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 and yeah you can have this kind of uh, skeptic instrumentalist attitude with respect to, to this kind of things this was a little bit to try mm -hmm. yes, um, I also have another question about the real life policy issue um, I'd like to push it a bit against um, the analogy to possibly mind and, and what we seem to have in quantum gravity. Because much of the recognizability I think in the philosophy of mind is really about possible realizations <coughs> in one of the same logical logically possible world. Whereas mm -hmm. the kind of <coughs> multi realizability that we seem to be talking about in in in, in, in this context, in quantum gravity context, is really different possible worlds, with different laws. So where we can realize, we have different worlds in which different laws apply, and these different laws then pick out different spatial and temporal structures. Yeah, this is and that seems to be a very important disanalogy, yes, I would say. Right. Uh, this is one way, <coughs> but, but I think there is also a different, weaker uh, sense of logical realizability uh, even within without it invoking morality in, in, in mm -hmm. one world, maybe I don't know, different ways um, the local what I would call the localization function can be instantiated in, in, in the same space and the same world you know, by different I don't know by different uh, quantum gravity entities playing yeah. playing the rights of functional uh, localization or in the same world. No no I mean so so there there's some similarities, I just think it might be worth it. But mulling, no, I mulling over yeah. what is the, the disanalogy but, mean in this context? Yeah, yeah. but again, uh, again, uh, even even for the, the, the debate in a quantum uh, quantum case and the debate with the of mind, there are disanalogies, theory. It's just that uh, I think uh, it's it's interesting to 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 to, to look at the philosophical roots of this kind of strategy. And, and, and how they are being used there to solve what kind of problems, mm -hmm. and see then how uh, how far we can go in quantum gravity context, bearing in mind the disanalogies. Obviously, please. 
<laughs> this is another thing I want to comment on. I mean, I think this is one place where linking up with, now admittedly, the terminology here is a bit of a mess, but linking up with the literature on production and emergence more generally in physics would be very really useful because, mm-hmm. um, you know, universality and multiple realizability are kind of messy terms that people have tried to precisify them in various, various kinds of ways, and there are clearly a whole bunch of distinctions you can make. Mm-hmm. One, one thing is whether there's a distinction between robustness under perturbations of the underlying physics and something like a sort of uh, more robustly defined universality, which seems rather different from multiple realizability in the mm-hmm. philosophy of mind. So this, I think in this case, the, the analogies are probably better served with other physics examples where people mm-hmm. have tried to work out these concepts quite a lot. Admittedly, I mean, one of my frustrations about literature, I, mean, I go and try to sometimes get in my own ways of various quotes, but, um, but, but one of my frustrations about literature is that people are among about terminology too. Oh, no, but, the, um, no. but, I think, but I think maybe the right yeah. place to to look for analogies to do justice to your your point is the kind of is the literature a kind of you know, the literature that stands out better than on Dr. Adam and stuff is very clear, but there's a there's a literature coming out of that thinking about things like robustness and perturbations yes. contrasted with genuine physics multiple realizability, which means something perhaps akin to but slightly different. Yeah, no, no, you're right. And and, and, and again the, really again the strategy here is, is not linked to, to there being multiple realizability in the philosophy of mind science. Mm-hmm. No, no, you yeah. fully right, and, and Karen has done some work on the and, and, and so on. We 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 discuss <laughs> <laughs> no. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> we discuss a little bit this in, 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 uh, in our manuscript and in the, 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 the small book with Daniele about robustness universality because in, in, uh, in the condensed matter approach or the field theory approach and when we talk about this on the of course we, 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 we have these, 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 these notions there and, and whether or not there are cases of multiple realizability as 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 you know from my understanding. No, but the, 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 the important point for us is that this kind of, of robustness, universality and so on, are well um, accounted for in this kind of structure and functions perspective. That's the Yes. Dr. Yeah. Lam, you forgot my quest. Sorry. <laughs> Is this a, a Freudian phenomenon or something? <laughs> no. No, I wanted to ask you about your examples of local. I think it was uh, a functional rule, was localization. Yes. yes. Uh, so I didn't understand my, the background with the examples, but my question was Is the functional rule played here one of the coordinates of space time? It's, n- it's not the same. It's this the, 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 they are called pseudo coordinates. They are not. They are not. Ch- it's not a chart. It's not a, a coordinate. It's a right. kind of physical coordinates. Yes, coordinate. but they, they play the by, by, the, functional by, by the physical fields play yes. the role of the coordinates. Yes. Right. So this is an example which is a functional role of the coordinates, yes. not a functional role of sp- space time. No, no, no. It's a functional role of localization. And in order to localize things, you need the coordinates. Yeah, sure. But that's an example of what the coordinates. Do, yes. Which seems easy. Now I can explain. Okay, what coordinates? Do. But this is. For, for, you know, very, very far from explaining what you know, yeah, space sure, time. Yeah, but it's an example. But without space time, it's, it's more complicated to explain what coordinates do. Right? No, cle- clearly, coordinates depend on 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 the existence of space time yes. and, and the geometrical structure yes. and everything. But you know, it's an easy example once you have that to explain what coordinates do. Well, sure. you know, anything which is one-to-one map and which you know preserves some of the structure is, is playing the role of coordinates. Yes. It's easy to explain. I think the the real problem is that you. I mean. If you want to do something with this, you need to explain what the functional role is, and then you need to be able to explain what the functional role is actually. Which are them? Point to them. Right. But Give here, I just take the, the example of uh, manifold points being used for localization, and then you can uh, then you can use coordinates and so on, a chart and so on, and um, you can redefine this in terms of relationships. Among relations among uh, dynamical entities or functional geometric typically without using the manifold point. That's all. And the role okay. of the manifold point is uh, played by the, these relations among these entities. That's all. It's, it's an easy example, I agree, but it's just to give a flavor of how it might work. That's, that's the idea. Okay, not, that's not more. Nice. So now that the chairman has stepped out, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is the problem that we don't have the coffee yet? Yes. Okay, so if we if we don't have the coffee yet, we might as well go on with one or more two <laughs> questions, right? Is that agreed or? People might want to stretch their legs a bit. Okay, is there an urgent question? <laughs> right? Knowing that there is no coffee outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Thank you. Uh, there is one urgent question. Right no, now. it's not urgent. It was only, it's only in the spirit of keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> so should we then thank yeah. Rasa again? I don't know what happened to the coffee, whether it got stuck in the snow as well.